The nation's best love chefs are hitting the road. This is not a belly. To compete in some traditional country shows. And I'm hoping to win one of those rosettes. On the way, they'll meet some of Britain's best local food producers. Why would you ever eat a cupcake when you have parking? <laughs> Before competing head to head with each other. <laughs> And the great British public. I thought the competition was big enough. Our chefs are at the mercy of the harshest food critics in the land, the beady-eyed country show judges. We don't like odd ones. This competition and I'm taking it very seriously. Hold on to your aprons, it's country show cook-off. Today, gourmet chefs Rachel Allen and Theo Randall jump in the Van Rouge and head off the next leg of their country show road trip, from the west of Scotland to Shropshire in England. Today, they travel from Keith in Scotland to Kington in Herefordshire. And it gives his battle. It's got three and one of them doesn't work. <laughs> So far, our chefs have competed with each other and local cooks with controversial results. No, I'm sorry, but that is, that's not even a sponge. Every time our professional chefs beat the local cooks, we award them points. And so far, after three dishes each, Theo is flagging with three points and Rachel is flying high with five. Oh, she's happy! Today, our dueling duo arrive in Kington, a picturesque town on the border of England and Wales. Kington is so borderline that up until the 8th century, it was Welsh. The western end of the village is dominated by a clock tower that was built to commemorate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Nowadays, Kington is an important market town and plays host to a right royal day out, the Kington Horse and Agricultural Society Show. The show was established in 1881 and both sheep sharing competitions, dog shows, horse and pony classes and scurry driving. And if that wasn't enough, there's the horticulture tent with competitions for the largest cabbages and of course the best baking. Our professional chefs have entered the open fruit tart with sweet pastry category. Is this contest a sweet treat or could it turn into a honey trap? <laughs> is to beat local cooks like Kate Jones. I unfortunately took two days off work to do this because I'm that crazy about it and I got up at half past five this morning in order to finish it all on time. But the person to charm is Judge Christine Fletcher and that will be no mean feat. I'm WI trained. Today I'm using sort of common sense rules with, with WI training behind me. It's textures and taste and the presentation that you know you look for. Our chefs will need to pull out all the stops to achieve fruit flan flawlessness. Rachel Allen's the queen of baking. Her reputation demands she wins, but the local cooks are proving hard to beat, even for her. Her chocolate cake didn't even place, and her baking prowess is on the line. I know. Now she's ready to come back fighting. We know you could do it, Rachel. Theo Randall specialises in Italian cooking, although he's British. Theo's a firm believer in simple, rustic, seasonal fare. I want it to sort of be kind of rustic and chunky farmer's dish. Despite his Michelin star status, Theo has only managed one country show prize so far. He's got to turn up the heat to be in with a chance. Today our chefs park up in Herger's Croft Gardens in the heart of the Welsh marshes. An area known to have shifted between being in Wales and England. Nowadays the gardens of Manor are firmly part of Herefordshire and attract visitors to the grounds planted to give stunning colour all year round. Do you mind me for you? <laughs> Now there's no rest for you two. You've got to devise a plan to make the best fruit tart and beat the finest of the local cooks. And they feel they're getting a handle on these country shows after all. It's been quite interesting, hasn't it? Um, really getting to know a little bit more, maybe yeah. about how they judged, how we need to kind of stick to 
the category title? Well, you just get disqualified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate cake. You know sometimes how you see in shops how they sell flan bases yes, already made because up. Because they're so it's spongy. More spongy. Yeah. I hope, I hope we're I think doing I okay while well, I'm making pastry. Well, we, I, I knew that. I mean, I, I, oh, I, I did say actually, hold on, the open fruit flan using sweet pastry. Sweet pastry. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, so now you've got the category right. There's going to be a lot of competition in open fruit flan. Do you reckon? Yeah, because it's the raspberry season now, mm. and I think there's, you know, wild blackberries. It's all yeah. about seasonality. I think they're going to be yeah. very switched on to local produce here. Your raspberries will do good, and um, you know what's in mind, do you? I've got a secret. No, opinion. I don't know what's in yours. Well, I'll wait and find out. Ooh, Theo's keeping his cards close to his chest. Should we go and taste some cider? Let's get some cider, yeah. <laughs> Herefordshire is renowned for cider making. Rachel and Theo go to visit the Dunkerton Cider Company in the heart of the Herefordshire countryside. The heritage trees in this orchard yield rare cider apples like Foxwell. This independent orchard also grows Perry pears, which are fermented to make Perry. Proprietor Ivor Dunkerton has produced organic cider and Perry for over 30 years and they're sold nationally and internationally. Ivor is passionate about his produce. Oh, everything is organic here, so we don't. There are no additives. We blend everything. We we okay. ferment each variety separately, and then blend afterwards. It gives us immense power, and the tasting of the ciders is entirely my partner and I. You know, nobody else comes to taste at all. You two are the chief tasters. We are the chief. We make the decision whether that cider is good or bad or indifferent. Well, so, so as well nice. as apples for making cider. You also make Perry cider. It's not Perry cider. This is some terrible industrial cider makers talk. It means Rachel. it's a mixture of cider and probably uh, imported Chinese pear juice. It's nothing to do with Perry. Perry is made only from Perry pears. So Perry, you just call it Perry, Perry not Perry cider. No, not Perry cider at all. Okay. Oh, I'm looking forward to having a taste. I can't wait to taste it. We could try, first of all, the Perry. Oh, that's lovely. So this is a blended cider. Your taste buds are going to be knocked a bit unfair. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Oh, I'm glad you like them. You well, my glass them. is the emptiest. <laughs> <laughs> now tear yourself away from that cider and go meet Ivor's partner, Susie. She's waiting to cook her signature cider and apple cake. Hello, you've been a long time on the terrace. Ah, we've been tasting lots of delicious cider. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed it. They yeah. are a little bit, I don't think it's just the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so a cider so cake, is quite a traditional cake. Yes, I mean it's just a classic sponge really, with um, unsalted butter if possible, and same amount of light soft brown sugar. Scrape the bowl down. I'll do all your hard work, shall I? Yes, excellent <laughs> idea. Then the eggs, two eggs. This is the mixture of the flour and the spices. So what spices are in there? Um, just coriander. Coriander? Ooh, oh, really? Is, is coriander always in a traditional cider um, cake? It is in the Hayes Head traditional cider cake. Wow. Yes. Rachel, I'm sorry, I haven't chopped this apple yet. It's a dessert apple, no need to peel it. Okay, it looks pretty. So then, we've got the rest of the... So this flour going next. Uh, self raising flour and a bit of plain spelt flour in. Oh, really? Just for a little bit more texture. What and next, ones? yes, apples. Mm. And these are the sultanas that have been soaking. Oh, cider. Yes, they've plumped up really nicely. And this is the rest of the cider as well. There we are. Okay. That's lovely, thank you. Gorgeous. So apples. Cider soaked raisins and extra cider and the coriander. May I have a little taste? Of course you can. <laughs> it's always well, very important to taste the raw thing. Because this is your cake, alright? <laughs> <laughs> mm. So we'll just put that into the centre of the oven. Um, 20 minutes we need to have a look. And the last thing we need to do is the syrup. More medium dry cider and granulated sugar this time. And I just dissolve it on the cooler hot plate and stir it till it's dissolved and then cook it for maybe a minute. If you're using yeah, a conventional oven, there. bake the cake for 20 minutes at 180 degrees. Just all around like this? Yes. Okay, and then just pour it over? Yeah, just pour it over. Wonderful. Okay, so shall I slice? I think you should. I've got some plates here. 
Oh, it feels it's really nice moist. Okay, that's perfect. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, oh, it's really, really delicious. Nice. Yeah. But with the syrup, it's just sort of taking it to another level. It's really. Mm. And you can't taste juicy the cider. And cider. You can taste cider. That's a really good cake. Oh, I want a slice. Oh, full of inspiration and Susie's lovely apple and cider cake, Theo and Rachel head back to the van to get started on their open fruit tart creations. First to get going on her raspberry tart is Rachel. And like her sweet short crust pastry, she's got to keep her cool. This is really not an ideal day for making short crust pastry outside. Um, I need it to be really chilled. So I'm going to try and make it as quickly as possible and then get it into the fridge as quickly as possible. So I've got 250 grams of plain flour. I'm going to add in some caster sugar, about 25 grams, and some icing sugar. I love using a mixture of icing sugar and caster sugar in sweet short crust pastry. And I think you get a, just a really lovely crumbly effect, a short, crumbly, delicious, delicious bite. Next thing, I'm going to rub in the butter. The butter's too warm when the pastry goes into the oven to cook. The butter just melts and it leaks out of the pastry, leaving you with quite a tough pastry. But if the pastry is lovely and cold when it goes into the oven to cook, the butter creates a bit of steam as the pastry cooks, and it helps the pastry to rise and puff up a little bit and give you just a really gorgeous, short, crumbly pastry. Rachel beats an egg and adds it to the mix. So just enough egg to bring it all together. Once it comes together, don't mix it anymore. Wrap the pastry up. You might as well flatten it out quite a bit because it's going to chill much faster. Another good tip is to put it onto the tin in which you're going to cook it because the tin, the metal, is going to chill faster in the fridge. Oh, good tip. She leaves the pastry to chill while she starts her pastry cream. This is quite a rich, delicious custard. That's basically what pastry cream is. I'm going to use five egg yolks and I'm going to whisk them together with some sugar in a bowl. Now, just before I whisk the eggs and the sugar, I can put the milk and a vanilla pod into a saucepan to bring up to the boil. If I split the vanilla pod, some of the seeds and the flavor will come out. Now I'm going to mix together the sugar and the egg yolks. This is a classic pastry cream that's used for putting into profiteroles, in tarts like this. Wow, it's hot out here. <laughs> now I'm going to add in the flour. Just whisk the flour in, make sure there are no floury lumps. No, that's perfect. Now at this stage, the milk is just coming up to the boil. I'm going to pour the hot milk with the vanilla, whisking all the time. One last thing I need is a pinch of salt, which just helps to back up the flavor a little bit. Saucepan on the heat, turn the heat down, pour this mixture into the saucepan with the vanilla pod too, that's fine. You do need to be careful because this, it's got five egg yolks in it. It can scramble quite easily. You can have a really milky, sweet scrambled egg if you're not careful. It's starting to thicken a little bit, which is what I'm looking for. Take it out now and it'll continue to set. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So what we have here is a thick, lovely custard that when I draw a line with my finger, it holds the line. Ooh, it's hot. Oh. That's just divine. As the pastry cream cools, Rachel rolls the chilled pastry into the tin and blind bakes it for around 15 minutes at 180 degrees till it's dry and firm to the touch. Great. This is exactly what I'm looking for. It's golden brown in colour, cooked all the way through. Lovely. Rachel leaves everything to cool and settle, giving Theo a chance to get creative with his blackberry and raspberry tart. Basically just put all the ingredients in. His short crust pastry is similar to Rachel's but with three beaten egg yolks. He's got a trick up his sleeve to make his pastry pack a pump. Okay, so we're going to grate the pastry into this tart shell. So I need um, a kind of rough edge grater, a little bit of flour just to put inside this shell so it doesn't really stick. And then we're going to get our pastry which has been in the fridge for about 20 minutes and it's kind of quite firm. And then just grate it like you're grating cheese. This may seem a bit crazy, but actually once you start doing it, it makes a lot of sense. So just using your thumbs, going in like that, just gonna start pushing this pastry up. And we're just going to grate some more pastry in the middle. And then we're just going to push it down 
so you get a nice even crust. This isn't scientific at all, you just want to get the right thickness of the pastry you want, so it's kind of what we want. Once the pastry tin is lined and popped into the fridge, Theo makes a start on his filling. Theo's also making pastry cream, but he's got some personal touches. Caster sugar, whisk and a strong arm, that's all you need. He uses three egg yolks in his filling. This is hard work. And thickens with corn flour. And then